Today we're going to do something just a little bit different. Um, when I was on the cruise, the Alaskan cruise, a, f a couple of weeks ago, there was a gentleman by the name of Randy who's, um, who gave me um, some sheets of paper with some questions on it and he told us, he told Danny and myself, that his brother Roger was supposed to be on the cruise as well but his brother was too sick and couldn't make it in the last minute um, and that mm, it made me feel really sad to hear that and and so Randy said if um, Roger was here he had these questions to ask you and he said that if ever you have time could you create a video um, like whenever you have time perhaps just create a video answering these questions so the questions were so beautiful and so deep I just loved them that I wanted to create a public video with these questions and answer them so all of you can get the benefit of the answers and so this is specifically for the two brothers Randy and Roger um, sending so much love to both of you because I mean it's such a beautiful relationship and I was so happy that at least one of you was able to make it to the cruise and so the questions on the sheet of paper the first one was from the time of your NDE until now have you had any aha moments when you gained clarification or a better understanding of the experience through maybe what you've heard from others or from reading or from your own contemplation and if so what would, would they be so in other words have I gained further clarification from other sources or even my own um, contemplation and the answer is absolutely yes um, because the near-death experience is not like just a one-off experience although yes it is the one-off experience is the is like a door opening but once the door is opened it's like the information keeps coming now I want to say here though is that you don't have to have a near-death experience you don't have to be close to death to have this happen to you it can happen through many other ways many uh, like through meditation or contemplation um, or through other crises happening in your life where you have a wake-up call different things can cause you to have an experience like this like an awakening um, and once you have a major awakening I mean people even create it with um, using plant medicine and um, and ceremonies with shamans and once you have such an awakening it's more than just a one-off thing it's like something has loosened within you that causes you to then be kind of open to more such things happening and when I say that it opens you to having more such things happening there's usually one major one so because even before I had the near-death experience I was always open to aha moments but it was only when I had the NDE that I was able to identify okay this is what I was getting wrong but you don't have to have an NDE to identify those you just need maybe you can have those experiences from reading someone's book or listening to someone's video or listening to someone share their own story which is why I share what I do but in terms of what are the kinds of aha things or what I have gained since my own near-death experience um, I have learned the fact that at the time of our experiences we are getting what we are ready for and we are getting what we are capable of receiving so what I have learned subsequently since the experience is that I don't have to go out in search of experiences or information I just have to open up myself more to receive more because when I had the NDE I had opened myself up because of the stage of illness I was at I surrendered I gave up I let go and I was completely open for that information to come in so what I have subsequently so at first I thought that was a one-off experience but what I have subsequently learned is that um, it is more than a one-off experience and that I keep getting what I'm ready for as I move forward in life 
And at that point, I was more open than I've ever been. And that's why this floodgate opened. And now, even as I progress from that point moving forward, I only have to keep opening up from the inside. And then the outside or my connection will give me what I am ready for. Let's see if I can give you um, some examples as I move forward. So um, what is happening now, for example, even information that I'm getting from the outside, I'm finding things falling into my lap, uh, like if it's a, from another teacher, if it's another book, if it's something I'm reading or listening to or hearing, um, it feels very guided that this has landed on my lap. Prior to the NDE, I thought I was very open, but I was out looking, seeking, uh, finding, like um, feeling that I need to do more, I need to learn more, I need to read more. Um, and I would take in everything. I wouldn't discern and, and I would try and absorb everything that was out there. I don't do that anymore. Now I'm more just um, open myself up to see what comes. I don't go in pursuit. So in other words, I don't go in pursuit of things anymore. I don't search for things anymore. And I'm finding that different types of teachers um, work is coming to me than it used to be before. Before I would go for whatever was best selling, whatever was mainstream. I would feel, oh, everybody's reading that. I have to read that. Everyone's doing this. I have to do that. Everyone's meditating. I have to meditate. Everyone's doing yoga. I have to do yoga. So I was like chasing, pursuing, trying to do everything that was out there. Now I just don't. I don't do any of that. And then if by synchronicity, something comes to me that calls me, that pulls me, I will realize there's a reason for it. And usually, sometimes it's not even an entire book. It might be a book that opens at a certain page. And so it's different things, but it's more like I'm being guided. It's more like what I need is coming to me at the right time. So it's a very different feeling. And that is what has continued to happen since the near-death experience. And I am feeling that I'm being spoken to, but I'm being spoken to through incidences. And also I get insights and aha moments, but also it can come through other people, moments on something might be said by somebody, a person sitting next to me. Um, it could be something on the radio, something on TV, something on the internet um, uh, and, or a book, that sort of thing. So um, I thought that was such a great question. But his next question um, was the one that really I loved, which is, do you believe you are still on a learning path and what are you seeking to understand more clearly? So yes, absolutely, I am still on a learning path and I don't think we ever stop learning. And if we believe we stop learning, then, it, then it, it's really a handicap. It holds you back, it closes you off. Um, and only if you feel that you are still on a learning path, are you open to new insights. The minute you think, that you know everything and you're a know-it-all, then you close yourself off to new information, new guidance, new insights. And what is it that I'm seeking to understand more clearly? Here's the thing, what I'm seeking to understand more clearly is the fact that time is not linear. Um, when I was on the other realm, I experienced time as not being linear. I was able to see all my lives, including my future of this life, pan out really clearly. And I could see them as though they were happening simultaneously. I was aware that what we perceive as a past life is something we're accessing right now. And that's, this is why uh, we get glimpses of our past life, especially if we go into past life regression. Like if you do the work of Brian Weiss and you go into past life regression, what is revealed to you is what is useful for you in your life right now. And we're accessing them because they are not in history, but we perceive them that way and we've labeled them that way. So um, because I experienced it this way in the other realm, that it was as if all my past lives were accessible to me as though they were running simultaneously with this present life and my future seemed accessible to me, but also there were what I call possibilities. It was as though every possibility also exists, like every possible future. Um, there was a future 
of my family with me in it and there was the future of my family with me not in it if I chose to die. And this is something that I don't claim to understand a hundred percent and especially to be able to articulate it in, um, in, in human language and so I don't claim to understand it but I can report on what I experienced and what it felt to me. But my own feelings and questions that come up is that if time is not linear and if all of time exists all at once, which is what I felt, and if I was able to see my past and my future as though it was playing out right now, then does that mean, and, and if I feel, for example, that when I die, it feels like I will be reunited with my family in no time, um, and if my, the members of my family who greeted me, my father, greeted me in the other realm, but is he also currently in another lifetime, what we perceive as reincarnation. Is he currently in another lifetime, but also was there up there to greet me? Does that mean there's a part of me that is up there that is greeting other people? Does that mean that when I was there on the other side, that some of the beings that I was surrounded by, who I felt were familiar to me, but I didn't recognize them, are they uh, are there beings who were on the other side greeting me who are also currently alive on this side? Do you see what I mean about the confusion it can cause in, as we are living in linear time and perceiving in linear time, how do you explain all these things? And these are some of the things that I'm still learning, that I'm still seeking, not learning, seeking to understand. And I'm seeking to figure out not only for my own understanding, but to be able to explain them in a more elegant way. Because I strongly suspect that even people who are alive right now, are, our souls are definitely also on the other side. It's like what, what I talk about uh, as the physical being that you are, you are just the tip of the iceberg, but there is more of you that you can't see. And that is the part of you that I encourage you always to access as your guidance as you move forward in life. But maybe um, other people's invisible part of them are guiding you who are currently alive. And so I'm not talking, so when we get messages, what we call messages from our deceased loved ones, maybe you're even getting messages from the soul of people who are currently alive and they are communicating with you, which maybe that's what our sixth sense is, what we call our sixth sense. When I perceive something from somebody, from my loved one who's on the other side of the world, it's their soul communicating with me. Um, I have many interesting things happen to me. Like for example, my mother, she comes to me in dreams, um, but she is alive. But in her dream, it's as if she is there with me and she's on the other side of the planet. But I think her soul tries to communicate with me. Now, my mother's memory, my mother's 92 years old and her memory is, um, has really deteriorated. And so when I communicate with her um, in physical, in real terms, she, um, she forgets what we've talked about like five minutes later. She can, her long-term memory is really good in that she remembers her childhood. I can talk to her about her childhood, but she has already forgotten what we spoke about five minutes ago or where she put something. And so, um, but yet I have had very strong and vivid dreams of her coming to me and being vibrant and alive. And in those moments when I have those dreams, when I come out of it, in, I go into a panic like, oh my God, has she left her body? And I call her and she's there. But I actually think that it's her soul coming to me even though she hasn't left her body. And so this is the, uh, these are some of the things that I, I'm still seeking to get a better understanding of so that I can express them better. Um, and also I had a huge glimpse of how that works when I was on the other side. And I'm always trying to weave everything in like, 
Um, because I do believe that when people do past life regression, that it really works. It really helps them. It's, they really are accessing into their soul memory of something that happened in, a, in another lifetime. And yet I have to uh, make that, even though I know it really works, I know it's true, I kind of have to make that work with the fact that time is not linear. So that's where my current or constant seeking lies is in making all those things, including reincarnation. I totally believe in reincarnation in the sense that we have multiple lives, but yet time is not linear. I'm trying to marry all of that together in this physical living in this linear time, trying to understand it with a physical brain. I know that if I was there longer, I would have had more clarity, but I also know that as I expand myself here in the way I understand things, in the way I research things, that more clarity will come to me. And also as I open myself up to receive more information. So I thought that was a great question. Um, and his third question was, have you noticed many common elements of the members of your audience and those who support you? And what are they? What are the common elements? There are quite a few. And one of the big ones is that I have noticed that a lot of people identify as being empaths, even if they didn't know what empaths were, even if they're not aware that they are one. As soon as I describe the traits of being an empath, people relate to that. Um, one of the things that I have said in the past is that I don't like using labels because they limit us. But at the same time, there are, um, there are descriptions, which I don't call labels. And sometimes people say, oh, I don't want to say I'm, a I'm an empath because it's a label and it limits me. Actually, I don't call empath a label. I don't consider empath a label. I consider it a description to help us to understand ourselves better. We are not limited by labels, but in the process of understanding ourselves better, it's, in, it's really good to read on things like the way different people are, different character traits. I like reading about um, Enneagram, Enneagram traits. I like reading about what narcissism is, what, uh, what does it mean to be a sociopath? What does it mean to be a psychopath? I like reading about what having Asperger's syndrome is. I like reading about what being an empath is. I like reading them because it helps me understand myself better and un understand other people better. But at the same time, I don't consider myself a label. So I just want to say that for people who are struggling with the fact that I sometimes um, use the term empath to describe myself and other people. At the same time, I do say that we shouldn't limit ourselves to a label. I do believe that we need to under um, understand because um, we need, that there's no harm in reading up about different types of uh, character traits and how we operate in the world because it helps us to understand what it is that is um, what our gifts are and what is holding us back because when I read about being an empath it made me realize that oh my gosh I may know who I am on a soul level but while operating here in this world this learning that I'm an empath here in this life really, really helps me. It helps me a lot. And I was able to take my own understanding of myself to a whole new level. But not only that, it was able to help me take my work to a whole new level where I could actually target a lot of what I do specifically for other empaths because I knew that my own illness was caused from being an empath and not realizing that I'm an empath. So I wasn't able to counter some of the things that go with being an empath. So that was so helpful for me. And that is something I'm finding that I'm constantly attracting other empaths to my work. But that is one of many things. I'm also attracting people who are dealing with physical challenges, physical illnesses, and who are struggling with um, trying to heal it. Um, I also do attract people who are just interested in what happens after we die in near-death experiences and people who are grieving. So um, those are the people, the commonalities of the people that I attract um, when sharing my work. Um, the fourth question he asked was 
right before you enter the hospital, before your NDE, you state that you finally just let go. Was that part of your NDE experience? Um, was that a part of your NDE experience? And can you expand upon that feeling and the reasons for it and the consequences? <clears throat> so at that point, when I let go, um, I was in a tremendous amount of pain and a tremendous amount of fear and a tremendous amount of discomfort. And <clears throat> if you keep in mind that at that time, um, I had been dealing with a debilitating terminal illness, which had been um, um, which had been with me for four years and, and had spread and I had fluid in my lungs and I couldn't breathe properly and I had an oxygen, I was breathing with the aid of an oxygen tank and I, when I would lie flat, I would choke on my own fluid and um, so and my muscles had deteriorated, so I couldn't sleep. I was so tired because every time I would sleep, I would wake up choking. So I couldn't sleep. Um, I was tired of sitting up. I was in pain, discomfort, fear. I was fearing death. I was fearing the illness. But I had spent all this time fighting, just fighting and fighting and fighting the illness, um, fighting to get rid of this illness in my body. And so... Um, so just think about how tired I was. I was extremely tired and I came to a point where I started to question, what am I fighting? I'm fighting to stay alive, but it's becoming too painful to stay alive. It be, I reached the point where I welcomed death. That's what the surrender was. That was what the let go was. It was like, even death is probably better than this. It can't be worse than this. This is already, I was living, I was in a living hell. And so I let go to just welcome the next stage, whatever it was. It, I, it was a question of what am I fighting for? This is not what I want. Um, so why am I fighting to hold on to this? And a feeling, it was a feeling of what's the worst that's gonna happen because the worst can't be worse than this. And that was the giant let go. And the consequence was going into the coma with the giant, because I was fighting to stay alive and to stay awake. And, um, and when I let go, it was like allowing myself to kind of choke into, um, I guess you could call it like a, a death. But when I allowed it, it's not like I stayed in that suffering. When I allowed it, and as my body started to feel that, pain it's like i left my body and i have and i'm going to liken it to this because i have often heard people um describe this is that um when people have tried to take their own life but failed at it i've actually heard this description when somebody uh, uh somebody described it somewhere i believe it's on the nderf site where somebody tried to take their own life and they jumped off a building, but they were rescued at the bottom. They landed on something and broke a lot of bones, but they lived through it. And so they described their out-of-body experience or their near-death experience. They said what happened is as they were falling, they left their body. And it's almost like the body has this defense mechanism where when you are facing certain death, you leave before the impact. So it saves you from that extreme pain. And so when your family is viewing you, they think you are in extreme pain, but you have left your body. So you're not feeling the pain. That's what it felt for me. When I surrendered, um, I left my body. And so even though my body looked like it was in extreme pain, because I let go and I stopped trying to fight to stay alive and I let go and it was like I was out of my body before my body felt that choking that took me into the coma. Um, so that was the consequence of the surrender and I believe it is very similar to when um, just before people go into death if they are uh, doing something, if they are having an extreme painful death like an accident, a car crash, anything like that and you kind of cringe when you look at the body and you think, oh my God, they went through so much pain. Actually, the good news is that they haven't. 
They haven't gone through that much pain. They left their body before impact. That's the point. They left their body before the impact. Um, and that's what I did. I left my body before the impact. So I thought that was a great question. So I really thank both of you, Randy and Roger, for those questions. And uh, oh, and by the way, I still have two more questions to go. But um, but I want to say here, if you have your own questions, please submit them now and I will uh, I will get to them after these last two questions. And um, so the fifth question is, prior to your NDE, what did you cherish as being there that might come from faith and beliefs? Okay, so prior to my NDE, one of the things I really cherished was reincarnation. That was one of the beliefs I had, I always had, and I still believe in it, but my beliefs around it has changed. I don't think that it is as straightforward as the way we think in linear time, as I said earlier. This is why time has been a big one for me as well, because it completely changed the way I view reincarnation. Um, I don't believe in karma the way I used to believe in karma, because I don't think we are suffering in this life for something we've done in a previous life. I really don't believe that. Um, I believe that every life is adding to the experience of the entire soul, of your entire iceberg. Um, and, uh, and by the way, I just want to say that I am really touched by all of you viewers there. I, I can see all the hearts and the emojis and the smileys and everything. I love them. I, if I had a button to click to send them back to you, I so would. Uh, you can't imagine how it makes me feel. Thank you so much for that. Love you guys so much. But uh, sorry, I just had to say that because it's so hard when, you know, I'm aware of all your hearts and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so now what I'm always trying to do with the, with the reincarnation, I'm trying to explain it. And I know how I experienced it in the other side. It was not linear. It was like every lifetime contributes to the experience of the whole. But here it's the other thing. There's two layers to it. Every lifetime you have contributes to the experience of your soul. And your soul contributes to the experience of the entire universe of every soul. So that's the thing. It's a two, two stage thing. You are one facet. Every soul is one facet of an entire, like if you imagine a diamond or a prism with lots and lots and lots of facets. And in the three dimensional world, every facet is one surface and one, each surface is a different person. And each of you is one facet of this whole prism, this whole diamond or prism. And each of you is unique and each of you adds experience to make this whole. Now imagine if each of those surfaces, if we were in a, add one more dimension, make it 4D, because here we're not talking about 3D, we're talking about 4D. Each of those facets is not just one flat surface. Imagine if each one is a 3D prism in and of itself. So each of those facets is a complete prism itself. And so each prism is you, your, in, your soul, which is all your lifetime. So each of those individual prisms has all these facets and each of those facets is one of your lifetimes contributing to make you whole. And so it's not like one lifetime you repay the other, but however, there is some bleed through because there are stories which are very real of people who are born with birthmarks of um, somewhere where they got shot or something in a previous life. And it's really interesting because I think in that life, the impact was so strong that their soul kind of carried that scar with them into the next life, but they probably won't have it in every life, but certain lives where what happened in that one was significant. 
but it's not as straightforward as the way I was taught about reincarnation and karma where, oh, you have to do good work to erase the karma from the other side. No, you do good things because it contributes to the whole, not just to erase karma from another life. That's a very linear way of thinking about it. We do good work because we want to raise the frequency of all our lives and of everybody and of the universe. That's why we do good things. We love ourselves so that we can bring a, a higher frequency into the world and into the universe and into every facet of everybody's lives. That's why we do good things. Um, so that was a great question. And the final question, number six, is what was the source of your understanding that if you choose, if you chose to come back, you would be well? So we could, so the source of my understanding, in other words, um, who was it or what was it that gave me that understanding? I call it a state of clarity, but we can call it a state of God. We can call it, um, it was a state of clarity from being able to see the bigger picture. And you can see this bigger picture when you get into deep states of awareness and meditation. You don't have to die. You can access it. Um, and this is what I like to try and do. And I encourage you to do this. Ask questions, be open, try and access it. So um, what I invite you to to think though is to, I invite you to perceive, is perceive big, like really big. Because for me, um, God is not a male being that's in the sky. And I, I'm not, and I hope I don't offend anyone by saying this. I respect everybody. I respect every religion. I really do. Um, but one of the things for me is that if I were to imagine a male being on the other side, I would have more questions than answers. I would be asking questions like, why male? Why not female? Um, why wouldn't, or if it was a being, why not um, like non-gender or gender neutral? Why not that? Uh, you know, I would be asking questions like that. Or if it's a being, why is it a being that has to look like us? What about other planets that uh, outside of our galaxy that have beings that don't look like us? So why would God look like us? And I would have many questions questions and then if there is if God is a being and if God created us then who created the creator and and so for me there's too many questions and that's the way I think and um, but so having said that I truly do um, perceive and sense the universe as being something greater than just one being it is more a universal collective but it is a collective of an energy. And I do believe our language limits us. That's the other thing. Our language limits us and our language forces us to use words that sometimes gets judged as being woo woo. And that is where our limitations lie. But however, if you allow me or indulge me, whatever language I feel like using, I do feel that the energies that govern us the energies of nature that govern us, I don't say that uh, we are the greatest thing. There are energies of the universe that govern us, that is greater than us, and it's greater than what we can perceive. And we have given it an image of a male being, but we have limited what it actually is. Because when you give it an image of a male being, um, what happens is that we have created it in, a, um, in an image of duality. This other realm was non-duality. So what do I mean by non-duality? It means that when you cross over and you are in this state of non-duality, um, you, there is no other. And so everything is known. Everything is known by all and everything is known by, uh, everything is known by all and everything is known for all. Everything you know is for everyone else and everyone else, what they know is for you and for everyone else. That's kind of the best way I can explain it. And so you become it. You become uh, and you merge and you become one with God. But when we are here as physical beings, we look to that energy as our source to get our 
enlightenment, our guidance. So I'm not saying there is nothing outside of your physical being to look towards, to, to access, um, to, to access. So there is, but that is what is feeding you. That is also offer is a facet of you and it is what you merge with and you become part of the all knowing kind of like a drop of water merging with the sea, but yet your soul still has its own unique purpose. It is still one facet of the whole prism. And that facet is still, um, has a lot of facets of its own, which are all its multiple lifetimes. So that's how I would explain the source of my understanding. Um, because prior to that, I used to think in terms of a being, but when I was there, I realized it was not a single being. It was a multiple of beings. And I also want to add here is that, um, I feel guided by multiple people and I feel different guidance, different energies showing up in my life at different times, depending on what I need. And it's the same for you, depending on what you need, different guidance shows up at different times. It's, there's a different, for me, there's like a different quality to, to the guidance and I can immediately tell the different guidance. You know, I can tell when it's someone bigger than a human that I've ever encountered in my life. And I can tell when it's my best friend who crossed over and that's her guidance. Um, you know, she'll be like, way to go Anita. This is something we've always wanted to do. You're doing it. It's, it's a very different quality. I can tell when it's Wayne and I can tell when it's something even bigger that, oh, this is part of your mission. This is what you have to do. You have to get over this fear because you have to get out in the limelight and this is what you have to do. So I can tell uh, when it's different forms of guidance that are coming through. So I really hope that those of you listening in got a lot out of those questions. I loved those qu questions and I deeply, deeply thank Randy and Roger and, uh, and I am sending you tons of heart emojis right now. I mean, if I had a button to press, I'd be like, click, I'd be sending them all to you. And I'm going to turn to Boo <laughs> to ask Boo, are there any questions that I can answer for our beautiful, beautiful viewers? Indeed, there are. There are a lot of questions and I've picked one up. Th this one came in about uh, nine or ten minutes ago and it's from uh, Linda Valdez Ripley who asks, if we create our own existence by our thoughts, why do we experience negative events even when we're thinking positively? Great question, Linda. And I think the answer may or may not be what you want to hear, but I actually don't believe we create our existence by our thoughts. Um, so that's the first thing we create our lives uh, we co-create. So there's another element we co-create with the energies around us. Um, and we co-create by who we are, not by our thoughts. Our thoughts don't reflect who we are because we can, um, we can change our thoughts on a dime and our thoughts are very fickle. We force our thoughts. We suppress our thoughts. We often suppress who we are. So we create by who we are. So let me see if I can elaborate on this. I have done uh, YouTube videos on this. So I would love for you to look back. There is one that I've done that is called the law of attraction and the tip of the iceberg. So please, please, please go back and watch that one because in that one, I really get into it deeply. And um, because when we, keep telling ourselves to be positive. I have to be positive. I have to be positive. What we're doing is we're suppressing who we really are and we're sending ourselves the message that, Oh, I, I must be a really negative person, which means I have to work on my thoughts. So my invitation to you is allow yourself to be who you are. Indulge yourself to, um, stop suppressing your thoughts, stop controlling your thoughts, stop telling yourself, I need to be positive in order to create a positive reality, because that very message is a dichotomy. That message, when you say I need to be positive, what it means you're saying is, um, it means I'm currently being negative. So I need to be positive. No, it's about 
I need to be me. I discover, I need to discover who I am. Why am I suppressing me? And the more you suppress your fearful thoughts, the stronger they become, the more you collect them, the more you keep pushing them down, the more they push back. And the more you will be manifesting a reality uh, or co-creating a reality with the energies around you that reflects what you're really feeling inside, which is the suppression of your fe fearful thoughts. And real quick, I also want to tell you that when I, uh, before I was even diagnosed with the cancer, with my illness, I was an extremely positive person and I had a lot of fear around illnesses and cancer and death and I believed that my thoughts created my reality and so I would suppress any negative thoughts so that I wouldn't create a negative reality. And lo and behold, what did I do? Because I was suppressing my thoughts and I constantly believed that I need to suppress that, I need to suppress that. But today, I just allow myself to be who I am. I visit every thought that comes up. It's like I, I look at it and I go, okay, what are you here to tell me? What are you here to tell me? And I allow them to release because I am not just a physical being. I am a soul and I need to allow that soul to express itself through me. But again, I went into this a lot deeper in the video called The Law of Attraction and the Tip of the Iceberg. So please check it out. Uh, in fact, that's one of my more popular videos. You'll see it has one of the highest views because a lot of people, um, have the same question. So thank you so much for that question. Do we have uh, one more or shall we, shall we uh, wrap up for this week? I know we're coming up to uh, wrap up time, but I want to sneak one more question in. Okay. It's from Swati Gaikwad, and I do apologize if I pronounced your name wrong, but Swati asks, what's the real purpose of life? <laughs> to eat chocolate. There is nothing better than to eat chocolate. The real purpose is just to come and experience and um, find joy if you can. There will be struggles uh, and just, yeah, it is to experience. And that's something that even I ask sometimes, what is the real purpose? But whatever it is, while you're on this journey, I will tell you one thing, there is no destination. The journey is the destination. So make the best of it. Just um, live fearlessly, like be yourself fearlessly, be as you as you can be, find your joy, eat chocolate. Um, and if you are going through struggle or pain or strife, don't judge yourself, don't beat yourself up, don't say, oh man, why am I going through this again? Because beating yourself up is uh, actually contributes to the pain. Just know you're human. As a human, we will always face obstacles. I face obstacles. Um, and every obstacle has taught me. It's taught me what not to do. It's made me stronger. And we're all in, in this together and nobody gets out alive. So thank you so much for tuning in. And um, if you loved this video, if there's anything useful in it that you think your friends will get out of it, please, please, please feel free to share it. And I would love to see you in person sometime. If you, if you check out my, um, my website, you'll see where I'll be speaking. I'll be in Sedona soon. I'll be in New Mexico soon. I'll be at the Omega Center on the East Coast. Please join me. Love to see you. And I will see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.